when you turn the ball over five times, four interceptions, one for a touchdown, three others in field position to set up touchdowns, you ain't gonna beat anybody. That's my team. That's my quarterback. I'm very disappointed with my behavior. But he don't. Welcome to the Between the Whistles podcast. I'm Coach Mac. Uh, with me, as always, is Coach Josh, and back from uh, the line of duty is Coach Bobby. Say hello, fellas. How's it going? Hey, what's up? So, we wanted to talk to you tonight again about a topic that is near and dear to our heart, and this time I actually mean it, uh, which is multi-sport athletes. We absolutely love kids who play as many sports as they can, uh, and uh, we want kids to play multi-sports, and we're going to tell you why. So, coaches, tell us why we love multi-sport athletes. Uh, we like multi-sport athletes because they, uh, they're they well-rounded. They're always out there working. They, uh, they bring a different level of compete to the table, and, you know, they're all around. They're in it, right? And it's winning. Yeah, the multi-sport athlete... Um... And they bring a, a different skill set, I think, like because they they're dealing with different people, different coaches, different uh, teammates in in the in the different sports that they're playing. So they're able to bring a different level uh, to football and what they're doing here. Right? Yeah. Sure. Well, we could get into specific sports, but um, let's be honest: the the transferable skills from just about any sport uh, will be you know will be pretty beneficial to most football players. I, I mean, I know we love basketball players, for example. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, because they they have they're great athlete they're they have great athleticism. They're you know mad hops. Um, they're usually in pretty good shape. They can usually move their hips fairly well. Yeah, for sure. And uh, generally, we also like the, obviously the sprinters out there. Like uh, speed, they're they're trained differently and lifting so that they have different twitch muscles that are prepared to do things. Yeah, one sport I think that gets kind of overlooked um, is lacrosse players. Yeah, uh, box lacrosse specifically here in Canada. It's kind of what we play inside a hockey rink. It's super aggressive. Uh, there's a lot of contact, but there's a lot of hand-eye skill, right? So there's a lot of you're you're watching, but you're catching a ball that's well above your head, uh, and without looking at the ball into a little basket. So those kind of skills help for certain positions, but the contact, the speed, the power, and all that uh, translates to football at every position on the field. And lacrosse is full contact, right? They're like, is, they're, they're laying into each other. It oh, is yeah. full contact, like violence to the max. It's unbelievable. Yeah, what most, these guys do. Most lacrosse players, especially the box lacrosse, like they're they're some of the toughest guys out there. And uh, if you can get a couple of those guys come play on your team, you're not gonna have to worry about the intensity level, especially on defense. Yeah. Well, we're we're in Canada. You said it, Bobby. So what about hockey guys? Yeah, hockey guys, kind of the same thing. Obviously. Uh, no running in hockey, but the contacts there, the timing, much like lacrosse, the timings there, the anticipation of a guy being in a spot that you think he's going to be in, uh, really helps in football. Uh, the vision you're able to, hockey players can see, they see a lot more than just a narrow field. Uh, so that helps, uh, transferable skill on a football field, football field in Canada, 65 yards wide. There's a lot to see. Um, yeah, Wayne Gretzky said that he always, felt that he would see what was going to happen and not necessarily what was happening. Sure, yeah. Anticipating sort of where a guy was going to be um, over where he you know, where he was at the current time. Yeah, and Wayne Gretzky, not a football player, but a lacrosse player in the summertime, so maybe that's what it is. He's able to... Because in lacrosse, lacrosse, they say, is the fastest sport on two feet mm-hmm. in, inside a hockey... Like, you play inside a hockey rink, super fast sport, you're constantly running, and I... I played lacrosse and after I played football, so yeah. <laughs> it was kind of the opposite for me, but it's full contact, full speed, and it's, it's really aggressive, really aggressive sport for football players. Nice. Yeah, but here's the thing with hockey players, though, is like as much as they would be great assets to our teams, unfortunately, uh, their season kind of starts right in the middle of ours, so like it's hard to get the hockey players, so if you can get the lacrosse players that don't uh, can't skate, then that's even better. <laughs> yeah, and I... I don't get me wrong, like, I'll take any hockey player any day of the week. Um, but I think there's a little parent interference there because hockey, let's face it, costs a lot of money. Yeah. 
and parents are not really willing to sacrifice their kid missing the sport that they're paying thousands of dollars for to just play a sport that costs, you know, a few hundred. And let's be honest, we're in Canada, so the dream is that everybody's going to be the next Wayne Gretzky or Sidney Crosby. Yeah, and but I think what's lost is that by the time you get to high school, if you're still playing, you know, your club team, the dream of playing the NHL is probably pretty slim. But in high school, I mean, we've talked about this a lot. You if you start playing football in high school, you can make it to the next level and play university football at that time, right? So it's something to consider. Yeah, um, and then a, a lot of multi-sport guys, baseball players, yeah. um, turn into good football players. Yeah. What about soccer? I mean, we get our kickers from soccer, don't we? We get our soccer players. We get our good abundance of soccer players. They can run. <laughs> they can run. They're super athletic, super light on their feet. They've yeah. got a quick directional change. Uh, the soccer players, and, and one of the coaches we coach with actually mentioned it to me, and I never noticed. I played soccer growing up. Um, but I also played kind of baseball and all these other sports. But the ones who commit themselves to soccer, they don't use their hands. Yeah, they don't because they them. they can't use them in soccer. So, yeah. <laughs> so so it's kind of a it's a different dy- dynamic. But in terms of like fast feet, fast twitch, like yeah. soccer players have it all. Yeah. They can turn on a dime. Yeah, and kickers. Well, and like, yeah, and kickers. Come on, guys. Well, kickers oh, are people too. They, they are people. But let, I played soccer growing up, and and I couldn't kick a, a football to save my life oh, when wow. I first started playing football. <laughs> I had to actually practice to kick a ball that wasn't round. It Imagine was really that weird. practice. Practice. <laughs> yeah. You're talking about practice. Practice. Yeah. <laughs> so um, every every sport kind of translates. I mean, if you to some degree, there's something in every sport that can translate uh, to football, but. It's, it's just the, I think, as much as the physical side of it is, I think it's the mental side that really helps because yeah. they're, they're getting it from different avenues, right? For instance, uh, rugby players. We have a lot of guys right now on our team that are going into rugby and they're getting uh, a different message from a different set of people, but kind of the same message. Um, and the program actually that our rugby guys are doing is kind of falling into place with, with ours. So it's, it's full circle at, at our school at least. Yep. Yeah. And I love, I love, 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 love. Every time I coach high school football, I love when the rugby players come out because they're some of the guys who are the best tacklers. Yeah. I mean, they're athletic, they're tough guys, but most importantly, there's just a there's a knack for the rap and the and you know the efficient, the smart tackling yeah. that sort of come nat- comes naturally with the rugby guys. Yeah, yeah as a defensive guy, um, and uh, we've all learned how to tackle before. Uh, this year and, and within the last five or six, seven years, uh, we were taught to tackle a very different way than we're tackling now. Yeah. And the way we're tackling now is the way rugby players tackle. So, like, the guys who play rugby, are they have that advantage already to the guy who's never played because that is what they do. They wrap you, they roll you, they hug you, they want to get you down as fast as they can. Yeah. Whereas in football, we were always taught it's like helmet on the ball, square up, bang as best you can. And now we're trying to eliminate that head, which is exactly what rugby does. Yeah. So uh, rugby guys, further ahead on the tackling. Um, and, and just third all around good athletes. Like I mean, yeah. you, you won't find uh, – rugby is constantly moving, right? So you won't find a bad athlete on a rugby uh, pitch. Yeah, I mean, there are a, lot, a lot of those rugby players are extremely conditioned too. So they've played a rugby season, and they're, they're banging, they're learning how to tackle, getting their head out of the way. And then they come to us, come training camp, and they're already conditioned compared to some guys who their season's already ended, right? And uh, it, it's it's a huge asset for us to be able to go out there and get the rugby players. I feel like if more rugby players would come up for their high school teams, you'd see uh, teams be more competitive, for sure. And I think it's I think it goes the other way as well. I think the football guys should be going out and playing rugby. Oh, like, like both teams kind of should go one with the other. Yeah. Um, I know when I played high school football, it wasn't that way because there was this, uh, I don't know how, how you best describe it, but there was, you know, this little attitude towards, well, you guys wear pads and we don't. Yeah. Animosity. Right? And it was like, yeah, I get that, but we're trying to hit each other at 100 miles an hour. Yeah. And really at that point in time, tee off and kill each other, whereas rugby was always this – get you, shoulder into you, wrap you, roll you, you got to drop the ball to the ground, pitch it back, and, and then we start over. Yeah. Uh, whereas in football, it was full speed and try to light you up as best we can. Yeah. But yeah. we moved away from that now. Of so. course we did, because it makes sense. But yeah. yeah. 
I think there should be some like work between the high school football coaches and the high school rugby coaches and the fact that we should come together and just kind of come up with a plan of recruiting for the two and then having an agreement about my football players will play rugby, your rugby guys should come play football, and then like each team is benefiting from that situation. And Because, I mean, I don't even know the coaches' names for the rugby players on our team. Yeah, I think we have a lot of – we actually have a lot of multi-sport athletes on our team. We're, we benefit a lot through that. Uh, we have rugby players, baseball players, uh, track guys – Basketball, lacrosse guys, basketball guys. We have a, a ton of them, and uh, and it's benefiting us, obviously. Oh, for sure. Uh, and and promoting that is benefiting us. We, I remember years ago, you know, when I first started coaching, it was it was never frowned upon to be a multi sport athlete, but it was like, ah, you know, you got to dedicate yourself to football all yeah. year, every year, right? Because we thought we were like the hockey guys, because kids who play hockey, um, a lot of their parents will make them play hockey all year long. The good ones, uh, they don't. The Sidney Crosby's played baseball. Wayne Gretzky played lacrosse. John Tavares played lacrosse. So mm-hmm. there's there's that avenue, and I think we're getting away from that in football now. Where we're like, play everything you can. Yeah. But just just be there at my workout once a week. Yeah. And we coach women's football. Yes. And a lot of uh, you know we as we know uh, there aren't a lot of women who are playing high school football, um, and there aren't a lot of women playing uh, you know necessarily football outside of that. Um, so when they come to us, some of the uh, the easiest transitioned players uh, who are playing football for the first time are the ones who come from rugby. So we have a great resource in local club rugby because there is club club rugby at a women's level, and there's also high school rugby for women. So we um, the rugby players are really the ones that we transition the easiest. So we're quite thrilled to to find them coming out. And also, like uh, I mean, for the women's teams, we could go up there and get the basketball players too. And just like for any of the male sports, you know, we can get the female counterparts going for a while. I, I think, I think you're seeing them. I think, I think there's, if we, if we were to go through and say, you know, what sports did you play in high school? You're going to see a lot of these ones, like the women and even the men and, and the kids, they've all played multiple sports. It's just that there's club rugby, yeah, right? Mm-hmm. Any other sports, a pickup sport, you got to go to the Y to try to play. But there's specific club rugby in this province. And it benefits obviously the women's football team because we can draw from them. Yeah. Um, and it's it's once again it's kind of getting rid of that that stigma of we wear pads and you don't wear pads. Yeah. And, yeah. And drawing everyone together. Now the seasons run kind of at the same time, but I think everyone's benefiting. Certainly the women's football is benefiting here in this province. For sure. For sure. So we were talking about. Um, how you know hockey in this country tends to want to keep their guys in hockey year round, and it's you know it's probably because they feel like well everybody's doing that in hockey, and they feel like that's the only way to condition their players um, to be uh, able to make it to the next round. But uh, Josh from the research department, we yeah. have seen that um, like at the next level, college football coaches love and look for uh, two or multiple sport athletes. Yeah, for sure. I mean. Uh, just a quick Google search, you can find out that like, the five reasons why college coaches love to recruit multi-sport athletes. And the first one is a multi-sport athlete gets injured less often, right? So let's face it, they're out there stretching all the time. They're conditioned. Their muscles are prepared for the rigors of a season. So a college scout and coach is going to love the fact that you're constantly playing because that means that you're taking care of your body, right? Another reason is uh, co- uh, multi-sport athletes are more coachable they like bobby said earlier they're learning from different people they're getting different voices different point of views on everything so when you come to a new team and let's face it some colleges it's it's a it's a it's you know a musical ride let's say and the coaches are always switching out so they know if they can recruit a player in they're going to be more coachable by new guys right and different voices in the locker room and then um you know multi-sport athletes they're playing so many sports, they're always competing. There's there's no time off. They're always looking for championships. They're always looking to get better. And uh, another reason is they like to get them because they can make smooth transitions into other positions. And lastly, multi-sport athletes have higher ceilings. So they have generally more potential to be tapped into. Mm-hmm. Okay, so then... Um... I mean, we know that college coaches are looking for athletes who play multiple sports. And obviously, uh, that being said, uh, I think we can all agree that a player who only dedicates themselves to one sport um, but but stays active all year 
uh, does off-season training, stays in shape, works on their craft. I mean, we can all agree that a, a single sport athlete is still a great athlete. For sure. Um, but I think what we're trying to accomplish here in this conversation is just to prove that um, that there is still great potential for, for people who want to diversify and be um, and be more exposed to more sports and playing sports all year round. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, we've seen it for years, guys. We're, uh, you know, we're old guys, so we know. Uh, I'll go back as far as Deion Sanders when it comes to multi-sport athletes, and he's probably one of the big ones. Um, you know, him and Bo Jackson from from our youth playing at the same time. Yeah, like what, two, what, that time that Deion Sanders he, played in. He a, played a football game for the Falcons and then a ball game for the Reds. In no, the, a World Series ball game. Yeah, right? for it, the Braves. It, for the Braves. Yeah. yeah. Same day, was it? Yeah, it was within like. It was in, within like 18 hours, something like that. Yeah. Like Ridiculous. Just but, crazy. But yeah, Jackson, so that's, Royals, Raiders. Yeah, that's the ultimate two sport guys. And I mean, nowadays you're not seeing guys play both sports, but you are seeing guys who played a sport who, uh, you know, who play, were a two sport athlete in college. And yeah. some would think that maybe they were going to be, an, uh, you know, a pro in one sport and went to another. Yeah, I don't think you see it as much here in Canada. At least I. I not locally. I don't think you see a lot of guys playing two sports, no. football or basketball. Uh, but uh, Josh and I are both big Notre Dame fans. So, you know, Jeff Samarja mm-hmm. was, a, was a standout wide receiver at Notre Dame. Everyone thought, man, this guy is going to be making millions catching Shark. footballs. Yep. Yeah. And he probably made the smart decision because he's still a starting pitcher in the major leagues. Yeah. And making, he made, he's making, making serious hand money. over fist of money now, right? I think. Uh, Golden Tate, another Notre Dame guy, baseball player, NFL guy, went to the NFL. Yeah. Russell and there's a Wilson. guy right Russell Wilson, baseball yeah. guy, yeah. drafted um, by the Orioles. By the Orioles. But doesn't yeah. he do training camp now with the Yankees every once in a while? Like Rangers. Weekend? No, he, Rangers. Was, he was drafted by the Rangers, I think. Yeah. Now he does the Yankees. But there's a guy right now that plays for Notre Dame, baseball player and football player. Notre Dame. Here we go. Um, um, hey, can we talk about I'll bring a local flavor into it, it, though. Matt Albright. Prince Andrew High School, Nick Downey, Prince Andrew High School, <laughs> um, and uh, basketball players at Prince Andrew and football players. So, <laughs> and Nick Downey is a track and field guy as well, hundred meters. He's fast. Ten, ten plus seconds. Kind hey, of guys, that make us look stupid on multiple occasions. Um, but, but so <laughs> just another quick note though, and we've all coached in different areas. Uh, if we look back at the guys that we've all sent to next level football. Uh, I think the majority, if you look back, would, would, would have played multiple sports in high school. Yep. You're, it's not the football guy that you're sending. It's the guy who's played football, basketball, football track, football, basketball track, and, and whatnot. So. Yeah. I mean, when I got to PA, the when I first started, I was the running back coach. And my running back at the time, top recruit in, in uh, Nova Scotia for running back. But he was also one of the top track stars in the same year. So multi-sport athletes, they're happening in your backyard as well. Yep. And I, I want to... Uh, I feel it'd be maybe a little irresponsible if we didn't refer back to um, last week's podcast where we talked about balance. Uh, the only thing I will say um, is to not sound hypocritical. I will say we do love multi-sport athletes, but not at the expense of school, not at the expense of, of your family and your 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 life balance. No. Um, and that's why you generally we frown upon you playing those sports while you're playing football, um, because you play those sports during the the opposing season. If you're a football fall guy, you play rugby in the spring. That's where the balance comes in. You're only playing the one sport. You're focused on school, life, all the other things on the side. But um, And just to chime in, I was in here. Great podcast, by the way. Listen to it today. Um, as the head coach of our football team, um, I have that responsibility to make sure that my basketball guys are not getting burned out in football when they're going to go to basketball. I know they're going to get that athletic workout there. Yeah. So I'll cut them loose on our practice early just so we can work on that balance without them having to make that decision yeah. for themselves. So you, you talked about how sometimes there are coaches who have animosity and want to keep them for themselves. Yeah. I think um, we would encourage coaches, and if you're listening, coaches, please um, encourage your athletes to play multiple sports. Obviously, um, remain focused, and you know if wherever they're – uh, wherever their best skills lie, I think, is where you should encourage them to play. But if they want to play multiple sports, they have to understand the repercussions of playing them at the same time. Um, they may not be able to, you know, like if you miss a football practice, you lose starting time, you lose reps on the field. But you know what? If that's okay with you to be able to play basketball around the same time, then we encourage you to at least be diverse. But um, but we also, you know, obviously good communication with the other coaches within your organization is a good thing. Yeah, and I was just going to say that the the other thing you want to do as a coach is is 
if you don't know the coach of that other team, ask your ask your player who's who is that coach, so I can get because it, it's not always the high school that they're playing for. They could be playing for a club team. Maybe you want to get a hold of that coach there and say, listen, here's our our schedule. What's your schedule? We can work something together here so that this kid's not getting burnt out for both of us. Yeah, it's just a little bit of communication. A couple of emails can take care of a lot. And like we spoke about last week. It's you know it's on the athlete, but it's also on the adults in that athlete's life to take care of them as well. And we, yeah, we're invested. Experience. We're invested in those athletes' yeah. careers, and yeah. we, um, you know, we're stakeholders in their life. So we want to make sure that we um, that yeah. we're uh, sharing their time with all of the other things. And again, not to beat that topic to death, but so then let's talk about what some of the potential downsides are. We're talking about you know uh, having to coordinate with other coaches and making sure that we're not overdoing it with the kid. But what are some of the downsides that? Um, that come with multi-sport athletes. Uh, exhaustion is is one. Even even we saw it this year, and uh, and trying to manage players on how long they're going to be with us and with another team. Yeah. Um, but the turnaround is just so small for these guys because if you think about, um, and just just an example of what we have, we have practice from three thirty to six. Uh, I cut our football, our football basketball guys would leave around five o'clock so they can try to get a meal in because they're practicing basketball at eight till ten. Yeah. Um, and then they got to go home somewhere in there. There's homework if they're getting that done, and if they're getting a full night's sleep, and then back to school the next day to kind of do the same routine. Yeah. So fatigue is a huge issue, right? Yeah. Exhaustion, they're burning these kids out yeah. super yeah. fast. So fatigue, exhaustion, um, burnout. Uh, what we talked about last week, the, the balance, um, and, you know, obviously grades yeah. slipping, uh, that all, all byproducts of the poor balance. Um, what about your chances of being recruited? Are you, if you're, let's say you're a football guy uh, primarily and you want to be recruited at the next level, do you think, I know we just said that college coaches do like multi-sport athletes, but do you think there's ever an opportunity where um, multi-sport athletes could you maybe hurt their chances of being recruited? Oh, easily. If you get uh, if you get injured playing rugby right before you're supposed to go into um, training camp for say the university that's been you know swooling you for the last couple of years, that's definitely going to hurt your chances. I think the university will tell you though if you get recruited the year before you graduate um, in the fall. Yeah. I, I I think a lot of schools will tell you that okay, like if you're going to go to if you're going to go to you know school or college A, yeah. uh, you know. Yeah. Once your football season's over, here's what we want you to be doing. And we see now that even some of our high school kids are working we have, out. We have a kid now, right? Yeah, who, for sure. Who played rugby grade 10 and 11, got picked up by a school here now, is going to graduate in June, and was told uh, not to play rugby this year. Yeah, for sure. But some, some of them aren't going to listen to that, right? No, you're right. And no, because could... some of them don't really buy into the dream. No, they it's don't. it's real, right? It's, like yeah. it's not tangible yet. I'm, yeah. not, I'm not there yet. Yeah. Okay. It, it, it all comes back down to last week's podcast of balance. Yeah. Being a multi-sport athlete does not affect your chances of being recruited, as long as you're not being stupid. Yeah. And once you have been recruited, you're not overdoing it and, and basically, uh, you know, risking injury um, and risking, you know, a potential, even scholarships in some cases if you're going to an NCAA school. For sure. That's a great segue because, um, as I've mentioned, the Between the Whistles podcast is brought to you by CanadaFootballChat.com. And if you become a CFC insider, uh, you can have access to rankings, analysis, uh, daily football recruiting news across Canada. Um, so if you go to CanadaFootballChat.com and sign up, uh, you can see the CFC Top 100, and you can see the guys who are now, uh, and multiple profiles on the guys who are uh, now the top recruits across Canada who are going to uh, some of the greatest Canadian universities and American uh, NCAA Division One schools. So um, go to CanadaFootballChat.com today and uh, and register to be a CFC Insider and, uh, and get a great look at that stuff. So if you do like the Between the Whistles podcast, please go to CanadaFootballChat.com. You can find us there. Uh, you can listen to future podcasts, but you can also listen to us anywhere where podcasts can be found, um, like Spreaker, iTunes, uh, Spotify, thank you, Josh, and a number of other platforms, even on YouTube. Uh, so please, uh, and of course, as we say every week, uh, Peanut Gallery, please reach out to us. Uh, we're always open to conversations, whether it be through social media or uh, private message. Contact us through uh, betweenthewhistles.ca or even just send us a note. Uh, we love to talk football, so coaches, if you want to talk with us, please reach out. And as always, thank you for listening. Deuces! <laughs>